Uh, <laughs> bear with me on this one. You might be a seasoned cardboard pro, having bitten more tiles than you can chew. You don't need me to tell you what food chain magnet is or how it tastes, but you, yes you, the other you, you might just be making your first flip into this ludological dip and you need some salsa to explain this. I'm the salsa in this analogy and you are I think maybe it's just best if I tell you what Food Chain Magnet is, and then we'll go from there. First published in 2015 by a then obscure Dutch publisher Splotterspellen, Food Chain Magnet immediately became a critical and fan favorite, sending out multiple print runs and climbing to currently the space of 28th best board game in the world, according to Board Game Geek, a database with over 90,000 entries and millions of users. Think what you want about BGG and aggregate ratings, but if you don't like this game, you're in a very small minority. Really? This game? This game with artwork that looks like it was made on Microsoft Word 97? First of all, now is not the time to talk about artwork. We'll save that conversation for a much more critical point in this video. And second, think about it. If a game with artwork like that is this popular and this well regarded, there must be something very special cooking under the hood. So let's look under the hood. In Food Chain Magnet, like in any economic simulator, you will win the game if you have the most money by the end of it. To get money, you'll need to hire staff, put up billboards or other advertisements, create demand for junk food, hire chefs to cook junk food or delivery people to collect bottled drinks, navigate a hellish corporate structure and eventually, hopefully sell a stupid burger. Let's start at the very top. When you begin, you'll have only a single card, CEO. That's you! As CEO, you'll have one and only one measly ability to hire one person. You might think that's thematically inaccurate, but let me tell you, MPI is already in its sixth year and it is only since November that we actually managed to hire officially a second person. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a pretty accurate description of what it's like to start a business. Who can you hire? Well, guess what? There's a whole pamphlet depicting a web of potential employees like waitresses, trainers, hiring girls, kitchen trainees, and other professions you can later train them into, like brand managers. Yeah, you try and say that without it sounding filthy. The only thing I don't understand is why they had to put it all in this odd, unwieldy shaped pamphlet. Oh, it's a menu. Here's where complications begin. So your first action is to hire someone. Great, you think, I'll hire a kitchen trainee. They can make a pizza or a burger, my choice. And if I do that, I will immediately get rewarded because of the game's milestone system. The milestones are the beating heart of Food Chain Magnet, a cornucopia of powerful game-breaking rewards to anyone who achieves their criteria first, and only to the people who achieve them first. Let's say I was the first person to run a billboard ad. Great, now all my adverts will run forever, whereas other players' adverts will expire. They can acquire that same achievement if they also run a billboard on the same round, but because all our choices of what to do have been done secretly, and revealed simultaneously. That's not something they can react to, only intuit. If they haven't, that achievement will be gone forever. Back to the kitchen trainee who was our original first choice. Now that it's round two, we can finally send them to work under our newly established corporate structure. Every round, you will select which of your employees you'll want to send to work. Your CEO can manage three people under them, but if your CEO manages the managers, then who manages the managers managed by the managers? No one. That's not a situation in the game. It's just your CEO, managers, and then the staff underneath them. Don't try and get fancy. Anyway, each round you will secretly create a hierarchy of employees in the form of a pyramid that you'll be sending to work, simultaneously reveal them, and then they will all do what they do best. Back to round two. Our CEO can hire someone, they'll do so, but it's not important who for this example. Meanwhile, our kitchen trainee made their first pizza. They could have made a burger, their choice, either one is great because either one would net us a milestone for the first pizza or 
burger produced. And that means that we get our first pizza or burger cook for free. Now that cook can't actually work this round, but we can send them to do things from the next round onwards. And then we'll realize that we have to pay salaries and cooks need salaries. How much money do we start the game with? None. What happens next? We'll fire the cook. We can't even fire anyone else because by the game's rules we can only fire people that require a salary and in this example the only person we have that requires a salary is the pizza cook. And if we could fire someone else next round we'd still have the pizza cook who needs the salary therefore making us fire someone. And meanwhile, our friends have been doing things that are actually useful to them. Managing your dirty burger empire is only half the battle. Food chain magnet lives in the world of advertisements, corporate price wars, and maintaining your little efficiency puzzle via cards is just not going to cut the mustard when you've got ruthless competition burning your buns. Food Chain Magnet plays via cards, but it plays out on the map. The tiles form a neighborhood with restaurants, houses, or even houses with gardens. And in this world, if you have a garden, you're willing to pay extra for junk food. If you acquire a marketing trainee or other advertiser cards, you'll be placing billboards, mailing out leaflets, flying an airplane with an ad banner, or even transmitting through the waves the need for pizza speed. Each house reached by your ad campaign that, for the sake of example, is advertising beer, will suddenly develop an insatiable craving for beer, and nothing else will do. If your restaurant can undercut the price and distance traveled and offer something better than your competitors, they'll come and eat in your joint, and you'll be making the money. And now imagine a system that lets you do all kinds of shenanigans. If you're blasting a house with adverts for Coke, burgers, and beer, then they will only go to a restaurant that stocks all free of those. In this constant struggle to undercut your opponents, you instead have the flexibility to double your price, make sure you're selling something no one else can deliver, and then rake in the dough. Dough being both food and money. And that's Food Chain Magnet in a nutshell. It's ruthless and unforgiving. It doesn't just punish inexperience, it's a swimming pool filled with mines, including the one I described earlier that you could step on on your very first turn, inevitably losing you the game. Whether this box is a cutthroat gauntlet or an experiment in game design is a question for a different video and not one I will make or entertain, because unlike our other videos, this is not a review. Oh no. This is a video called Food Chain Magnate. Is it Monopoly? Right, okay. I know some of you might be mildly angry because I'm trampling on sacred ground here, but just trust me for a little bit. By the end of it, even if you don't agree with me, you won't be upset. I promise. It is a very drastic comparison. After all, one of these is an iconic example of bad game design, lazy mechanisms, and an incredibly long playing time. And the other one's Monopoly. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I just wanted to see your face when I said that. On the surface, comparing these two games is ludicrous. First of all, the designs are literally a century apart. And in one of them, you'll create complex corporate structures and get rewarded for intimate knowledge and outmaneuvering your opponents. In the other, you roll dice to see how far you can walk your top hat and wonder how Christmas took a wrong turn so suddenly. But here's my argument. Regardless of what you might think of the pedigree, I propose that not only do both of these games try to achieve the exact same thing, but that Food Chain Magnet consciously or coincidentally spun out of Monopoly. First, let's look at some of the more obvious parallels like artwork. Monopoly had many different versions, but the one we associate with the most is this pastiche of 50s American white picket fence ideal. You don't need to look at FCM's cards long to spot the same ethos on its characters, and even the much maligned and loathed map tiles perfectly emulate the hospital green squares with black lines look of Monopoly's board. And the tiles for gardens have an actual white picket fence. Then there's game length, and much has been said about how Monopoly isn't just a miserable time, it's also a very, very long miserable time. Well, guess what? Food Chain Magnet is also long, and the more people you play it with, 
the longer it gets. Whilst perfectly manageable at two or three, it becomes cumbersome with four and ridiculously protracted with five. It would be even fair to say that game length is directly parallel to player count in hours, which makes the six player module in the ketchup mechanism expansion ever so questionable. You might say that that's an issue with player count specifically, but I've got news for you. Play Monopoly with two or three players and you'll probably finish it quicker than a game of FCM. And you might say to me, Efka, that's fine. Games can be long. It's whether you're feeling engaged throughout that matters. Food Chain Magnet undeniably rewards familiarity and skill, creating disparity at the table. It is not entirely uncommon that one player will dominate all the proceedings and you'll arrive at the same two conclusions hours later that you had at the 10 minute mark. One, Steven's going to win yet again, and two, Steven. The difference of course is that in one of these the runaway leader is created via a carefully crafted plan and masterful execution and in the other one we rolled some dice. And it bears mentioning that the ketchup mechanism expansion offers the titular ketchup module. Why is it called the ketchup mechanism? Oh you got me again. That the manual tells us is a catch-up mechanism, only in theory, but in practice will let more skilled players abuse the system further to create even stronger chokeholds. If you can sense the irony in FCM's design choices, you're barking up the right tree. Once again, just like Monopoly, it's laden with humor poking fun at capitalist structures. Each round, you'll be choosing which of your employees will be sent back to work and which won't. If they work, they are part of that CEO pyramid I've showed you. If they don't, and I'm not kidding you, they are on the beach which might seem nice to anyone who's not been under a zero hour contract. It won't take you long to remember some of that same type of humor in Monaco Man Game, even now we take it for granted. Also, Monaco Man Game doesn't have a man with a monocle anymore. And I'm just not sure how to feel about that. This is a system where getting out of prison is literally achieved via a pass card that you could even purchase from an opposing player, literally calling in a favor to circumvent the law. It's worth reminding here that Monopoly was originally designed by Lizzie Maggie and known as The Landlord's Game, a critique and teaching tool for the consequences of land grabbing. The version we know and love now was plagiarized later by a man and then both versions were sold to Parker Brothers. Lizzie got 500 dollars for her patent and whilst Parker Brothers did do a print run of her version it is now known as one of the rarest board games published in the 20th century. Meanwhile the Monopoly version was printed over and over again eventually producing countless branded variants and spin-offs. The ultimate irony here is that it didn't even matter that Lizzie Maggie got there first or that she held multiple patents for this game. She just didn't have enough financial clout and someone with more influence came in and boxed her out. And thus we arrive at the only point of comparison that matters. Food Chain Magnet, just like Monopoly, is a pastiche of capitalist structures, but one where the scope of play strangely mimics the history of Monopoly. Remember milestones? Achievements that reward you for being the first person to do something in the game? Not only is the nature of this system emulating capitalist strategies of establishing a foothold and then boxing everyone out, but also remember that turn one trap I told you about with the kitchen trainee? Well, that perfectly illustrates what happens when you try to swim in a shark filled tank with nothing but a free willy t shirt to defend you. And if you survive that gauntlet and achieve success, you'll then proliferate your strategy continuously until no one can stop you. Frequently, conversations spring up about board games as art. Are board games art, people will ask, which is a daft question with an obvious answer. What's more interesting is asking why are board games art? What makes them artistic and more importantly, 
different from other forms of art. I always fall back to Alan Moore and his response to why he doesn't want his comic books adapted to film. Here he draws a parallel between the two mediums. They're both visual and narrative based at the same time, but ultimately a comic book should be a comic book because it has to be a comic book. It can do what no other art form can, and if it was meant to be a film, it should have been one to begin with. So what can a board game do that other forms of art can't? Well, my answer is that unlike a book or a film or what have you, it can program your brain to think, feel and act in a moment. Steve, you bastard, that's my spot, get off of that, is something we've all shouted in a game more than once. Sure, a song could make you move, it could make you dance, it could even make you sing, but it cannot put you in the headspace of your subject. It won't let you emulate the thoughts and processes. That is the realm of games alone. I think board games achieve this in two different ways. Some emulate the fun of an activity. If you're playing Captain Sonar, you get to pretend you're in a submarine. I mean, it's not an actual representation of a submarine. At no point will your actions lead to a nuclear meltdown with no chance of escape. And some games emulate a more abstract idea like resource management or counting probability dressed up in theme. But more and more a different kind of game emerges. Instead of carefully crafting its systems to make sure you're having a good time, it's more concerned to force you into situations less comfortable. A great example of this is our earlier reviewed Pax Premier 2nd edition, where you play as Afghani warlords constantly switching allegiances between foreign powers for personal gain, a subject that is never easy and you're never really sure whether you're the hero of this story. I guess looking at it from a narrative perspective is helpful. In some games you are the cheerful protagonist going on a romp and in others you are put in the shoes of a person you never want to be in real life. I think that Food Chain Magnet falls very much into the latter, which brings us to the ultimate question. If you force me to answer whether Food Chain Magnet is Monopoly at the start of this video, I would have sheepishly been forced to admit that no, it isn't. But without the context of the multitudes of parallels and similar goals, none of the rest of what I had to say would have made any sense. Food Chain Magnet isn't Monopoly because unlike Monopoly, it succeeds at its goal. It's a critique of capitalist systems, but instead of taking you along for the ride, it puts you into the driver's seat. The fact that the seat is inlaid with sharp metal spikes is another matter altogether. And I guess I have one final admission to make. I don't actually enjoy playing Food Chain Magnet, which is a testament at how good it is at what it does. I don't like Monopoly because it's tedious. Whereas FCM, I don't like it because it reminds me too much of my dad, who in real life has constantly taken the turn one trap without ever learning anything from his previous attempts. And I can't think of any other game that does that, which is not an indictment, it's praise. Finally, I have no idea whether the designers of Food Chain Magnet had any of this in mind. I'd argue that some of this is obviously evident and some of it is probably my own conjecture, which shouldn't even really matter. You could read everything that Shakespeare wrote in less than a year, but you couldn't read everything that was written about what Shakespeare wrote in your lifetime. Art is personal and our response to it should be personal. To paraphrase, what we get out of art is up to us. I'm just glad that there are games these days that provide us with so much.